As the great Dr Dre said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Unfortunately, in political circles, they've used nationalism as a tool to manipulate and manoeuvre, whereas nationalism in its pure sense is just, I love the country I'm born in, or I live in even, the people that are there and the experiences I have with it. You mentioned they're fleeing Lebanon in 06. The day I was due to leave, Israel invaded. They bombed the airport. A lot of infrastructure was blown up. A couple of hundred thousand people in no man's land lost crying, trying to get out. You could genuinely just disappear and no one would know what happened to you ever. I sit here contending with this cheese on My guest today is one of the most recognisable rugby coaches in the world. A rugby union player turned coach who led Australia to the 2015 World Cup final and sent England packing from the group stages in their home tournament, might I add. Checks. Have you have Dan Cole, Mike Brown, Anthony Watson, you spoken to him about that game? No. 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 <laughs> No. Because uh, there's six or seven others where they pumped us, so yeah. I should rather keep it quiet. Take one, give one. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> five years later, in an emotional and personal decision, he code-switched to Rugby League to coach the team of his parents' home nation, Lebanon. A decision which led to him to be dubbed the busiest man in rugby, as he simultaneously coached Lebanon's league team and the Argentina union team. The only man to have won the major domestic competition in both hemispheres, he currently coaches the English Premiership's Leicester Tigers. My guest today, Michael Checker. How are you, Jax? Very well, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate right. it. Um, the reason I get, just to be upfront about this, right, the reason we wanted to have this conversation, other than, of course, your own pedigree, your career, and I want to talk about all of that, but the kind of immediate impetus is this appointment of the English football manager, Thomas Tuchel, who is a German, and there's kind of been this Ferrari, this kind of non-English person manage the team, et cetera. And your experience, which I kind of alluded to there briefly, I think it's an insight that is frankly invaluable into that conversation. So we'll get there. Yeah. But in order to, I think, fully understand it, we probably need to begin at the beginning and chat a little bit about you, your background growing up. So maybe I would just sort of start by saying, can you tell us about, you know, your home growing up, your childhood, um, as a second generation Lebanese immigrant. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. I <laughs> suppose. Pleasure. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> Get that bit out of the way. Yeah. The, <laughs> it, it's interesting the, the background and how it leads into sport, I suppose, because traditionally, I suppose, these types of sports, say the contact sports, they wouldn't be big in, you know, back in, in Lebanon, for example. So when my father emigrated um, in 1950, he hadn't met my mother by that stage. He came, you know, Australian government were over there canvassing for workers post the Second World War. And I'm not sure if he didn't have his own issues around the village. You know, village politics was pretty fierce back in the day. So he probably had to make a sharp exit <laughs> at some stage. And he got out. He uh, he came to, uh, to Australia with a mate of his. And they had no one there. Like, they, they knew no one. I think just even that bravery of leaving your country, probably with the not knowing you may not go back, you may not see your parents again. They get out, it was Christmas Day, I, I believe, and uh, the taxi driver asked them, like, where where you want to go? And they didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have an address. They didn't have anything. And they asked them <clears throat> what country they came from. So they said Lebanon. And uh, he dropped them at a place called Redfern, which is the home of the – well, which is where the, the Maronite church – Lebanese church is, so they figure there's a community around there somewhere, so we'll drop them there. But, of course, the church was right across the road from Redfern Oval, which was the home of South Sydney Rugby League team, you know. And then, of course, they would have they would have camped in there somewhere, a lot, you know, a, 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 a hostel or something like that to get themselves going. And they started going over to watch the footy, you know. I think that helped them integrate into Australian life. Obviously, back then, racism, not, not in its... Uh, not in a nasty form, in mean, its normal, you know, the generic form that happened then, people wouldn't have even known, you know, it was, would have been going on and they wanted to integrate and, and <clears throat> assimilate into the community as best they could. So I think they saw uh, rugby league as a chance that, you know, getting in there, you can meet different people, meet some friends. So they got in around the sport early on and then, of course, life went on and <clears throat> we were all, we, I'm the youngest of three kids, uh, an older brother, an older sister, and... We were in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, a little bit diff located in a different place to where the community, the Lebanese community would have been. They would have been more west and just grew up with the games, you know, playing a really good balance between uh, our homeland, ethnic lifestyle, like 
food, even language. Our parents would speak to us in, in Arabic and we'd answer back in English. So we got the year for language early on. And then we were a very, really good balance between Aussie and Leb, you know, and I think that that was really good. I'd come home from school and they, you know, my mates would already be at the kitchen. That round, You could get around the back of our house to the kitchen, so they'd already be there eating, you know what I mean? They're getting on. Well, they love the food, you know, so I'd go, what are you guys doing here anyway? I'd come in there and they'd all be there. And it's still the same now. I'm living overseas. My mates are still going over to my mum's place to get, get fed, you know. What's her classic dish? What's the what's Well, the all, the, all the Lebanese stuff, you know, kibbe, uh, hummus, tabbouleh, kafta, you could have it all, you know. it's uh, When you go there, you know you're going to get fed proper, right? Mm. So, you know, maybe sometimes when I was younger it wasn't that easy, you know. You got called names and you were, you know, you don't, you don't realise that at the time but and you were busting to be part of the, you know, an Aussie kid in the community and... Yeah, well, it wasn't easy sometimes, but I think you fight your way through it makes you makes you better because you have a, the appreciation of having two homelands, you know what I mean? Um, and my dad always used to say that he was a Lebanese Australian and that we were Australian Lebanese because we're born there and that's our that's where that's our land and then we've got the heritage back. And I really like that balance mm. that we we're able to to mix and I've tried to live that throughout my whole life, you know, about whether it's related to what's happening back in Lebanon and always tried to do things as an Australian Lebanese to either be involved or still got a lot of family over there. And it's funny, you know, I remember <clears throat> my uncle came from, oh, he was actually in Brazil, a Lebanese, one of our uncles came over and it was 1988. We were, we were, I was playing for Ramwick, we were playing the All Blacks and they, they used to play a club team on yep. the first part of their tour, right? And he brought him to the game. This guy's never seen rugby ever. And he goes, he, he would have used foul language in Arabic. You he can said, use foul language if you want. Why did you bring me here to watch this barbarians? I'm like, I am out of here. He left at half time. <laughs> <clears throat> he didn't want to know about it. And he was <clears throat> literally into my parents saying, how can you let your kids do this? What, what are you doing? <laughs> it's dangerous. Mate, I doing? remember my cousin, Simon, you know, he's, he's passed on now. He was like our leader of our generation. And the story they would tell about him, he went to the same school that I went to, Marsland College in Ramwick. And he, he went to Australia, I think, when he was 10, 11 or 12. So you've got to play footy, right? You got to, and he'd never seen the games, didn't know what was going on, could hardly speak English proper. Well, he got the ball and they smashed him. He ran off the field looking for a brick to hit someone with, you know, because... <laughs> oh, it's like that, is it? Well, yeah. yeah. What, what's this game? <laughs> <laughs> And that's the thing we got to remember. Like you go to some of the countries, uh, and I've travelled to a lot of countries involved in rugby, both codes, and they a lot of people can't believe the game itself. Mm. You know, even if you go to America where they've got uh, American football, but they go, well, you what? You're playing that game with no pads, yeah. no no protection. Mm. And what are you guys doing? Are you crazy? And um, yeah, we sort of are, I suppose. When you think about it in that context. Yeah. And well, brave but, is possibly the other word for it because it's the one you used earlier to describe your dad making that yeah. trip. You spoke about, uh, I guess, the fight in a way of coming up in that environment, mm. being who you are, having that background. Crazy is one word for it. I think brave, brave is probably another one to describe it, right? Yeah. Well, you. It is. I think you. But you learn. You don't feel it when you're playing the game because I suppose you learn it from an early age how to fall, how to how to take a hit, how to almost how to protect yourself inside of those, the, the rules of the game. But I, th I do think it was, um, and, and if you look at rugby league in Australia, the Lebanese community, like it's heavily entrenched. Like it, you could see, we played, when I coached Lebanon, played in the 22 World Cup and uh, we, were, we had amateurs. Like we had some NRL, maybe half a dozen NRL players and the amateurs and we're up there competing with you know New Zealand and, the, and but the community and the world world cup before that it was in Australia like I think they were getting bigger crowds than the kangaroos in some games mm. you know because of the community there they're strong behind a few teams in particular out west uh, Canterbury Bankstown uh, Parramatta St George are involved in and they're big they're big into the game and they like it's because obviously it's a very working class game mm. from its origins and that was the community when they came down so there's a strong filter for the Australian Lebanese people of of being involved in rugby and rugby league and rugby union. I mean, there's so much in your answers there that I want to get into and want to unpick, and I, hopefully we can cover it all over the course of the conversation. 
whether it's um, the popularity of the sports, what's going wrong in governance, um, the sort of your experience coaching Lebanon and having coached Australia as well. We'll get to all of it, <laughs> hopefully. Let's start then. Let's let's use your experience, you know, coaching Lebanon, coaching Argentina as an Aussie, and coaching Australia as a Le Australian Lebanese, as your dad mm -hmm. would put it, rather than Lebanese Australian. Can you empathise, sympathise, or understand a little bit this conversation that's happening in England right now about the appointment of Tuchel and 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 him being of a different nationality to the national team? Yeah, it's. Uh... I, I think that it's a very interesting one because we have it as well with Australia and, you know, we've, we've got foreign coach right now in rugby. Um, and I think it comes down to the, the clarity of identity of your team. I feel like uh, if there's a, if the football team, for example, if it's on an English football team, has a definite way of playing the game, has a clarity of its identity and therefore that English, that only English coach, English coaches would be cultured in, would have a, a history in. And I know that there has traditionally been a style of English football, um, uh, much more physical, uh, more the long ball game traditionally, get up there without talking too much of the tactics of football, you know, but uh, that's traditionally been the game. And that's what English coaches would be coaching. Well, yeah, I think that you'd want to keep that. And that's, if you look at the rugby discussion, it's more about, for Australia, for example, where's our where's the running game gone? Where's that that idea of innovation and attack? Uh, that's where. But then the other question is: Are our coaches, other Australian coaches, well versed in coaching that mm. now? Has that changed? Are we are we latching on to a, a romantic notion of what we had in past years? And that's, I'd say, if I look at football being played here now, it's obviously very different to what it was played previously. They certainly weren't kicking around the, their, their own goal box like they are today back in the old days. I, I, I started watching um, English football. It's, this is interesting. And we'll get back to that. When In the 70s, when um, my, uh, my, we get one show, uh, like a summary show of the English, um, uh, the top flight back then, I suppose. And it was one thing I did with my dad a lot. You know, we'd sit up, we'd watch it. It was late at night on a Monday night, maybe. And I suppose that's where I got, I'm a West Ham supporter. Oh, so yeah. that's where I got my connection. And now Foxes as well, obviously, <laughs> being a Leicester. Went of to one of the game. Well, no, I went to the first game against Tottenham. The atmosphere was um, amazing. Yeah. I'm hoping to be there, you know, for a few more games throughout the season. But nice. um, I think that that connection uh, to the way you play the game or the identity of the team is really important. I think if you look, say, at New Zealand in rugby, clear identity mm. of how they want to play the game, really clear identity about the team and therefore, and coaches that have been brought up to play that style of game and therefore the, the production line continues. It's you, like, it's a, I mean? yeah, it's a no brainer that Razor gets the appointment, right? Pretty much. Or any one of yeah. another, Jamie Joseph or, yeah. or, or even Joe Schmidt. It could have, could be any of those guys, right? Now, so well, the question I'd ask now is say, okay, with England, uh, after Gareth left, is there a coach that stands out that identifies the English culture of how we want to play the game and what we want to bring, I suppose, emotionally as well to the team because there's an yes. emotional element as well that yes. goes on with it. And as a coach who's coached different nations, that's if you want to try and succeed in that, in, in that role when you change over to another, it's not the team that has to adapt to you. It's you that has to adapt to the team and condition yourself emotionally into what it means to play for England in this instance in football because if that's articulated by the team because that's truly important. And I, I've had to live that a couple of times now, in different scenarios as well. Example, the first days I was involved in Argentina with Argentina. Uh, first I was involved with Argentina with Mario Ledesma who was the head coach and, and I'd go down and i say, listen, uh, I come down and I'm just in my civvies. You know, they're all in the gear and I'm in my civvies, just in my normal clothes. And they, they're they looking at me a bit strange. You know, everyone, it's very institutionalised. Everyone goes down to their team <laughs> kit or whatever. And they, I said to them, look, it's going to take me some time. I can't just, you, I don't think you'd like it if I just went, oh, I, 
I'm Argentinian now. Yeah. No, you need to build the connect. And maybe every day I'll come down with another little bit of kit on, which one is sock. what I did. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> T-shirt one day, a sock the next day, because other I had to drag it out to yeah, make the, nice. the, the symbolism of it right. <laughs> Even the same at, up at Leicester right now where I go, I can't just jump in there straight away in a traditional club like that and say, oh, yeah, I'll, let's go. This is what we're doing because, you know, yes. I'm – I'm a representative of club. I have to earn the right to put that shirt on. And I think how you assimilate into the the group and understand the the national, from a national team point of view, what nationalism is. I've even had to go through that as an Australian. Tell me about that. Well, obviously, like I was talking before, growing up as an ethnic kid in, in Aussie, it wasn't always, um, you know, it didn't always make you proud of, of Australia. Your country, yeah. yeah. You know, because you thought, why? Why would you do that to me? Why would you say that to me? Why would you, you know? And I'm, I'm certainly not complaining, right? I want to make that clear because that's the part of the social evolution that we've gone through to be able to be where we are today. If we didn't go through that, if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be here today. That's why I don't like all that sort of cancel culture that's coming in and we're trying to, because if we didn't go through that, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Mm. And that's, everyone's got their part of the journey to fulfill. And that was ours. And our, and before us, people had a lot harder journey to fulfill as well. Yep. Right? That we, we, relatively, we probably had a lot easier. It was still tricky, but once I, I sort of got the Australian job by surprise, the coach quit very last minute. And I was always outside of the establishment, even as a player. Um, so I was surprised, first of all, that they, they even asked me. And then <clears throat> I had to go, right, I, I can't. I need to understand a bit more about the nationalism part of Australia. I, I probably had sung the national anthem a handful of times. Really? Beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. If I was going to sing the anthem with the team, I needed to mean it. You can't fake that stuff, you know. I, not in my mind, you can't. And I, you had a hesitancy uh, about doing that because of your experience growing up in well, Australia. Well, I didn't have a hesitancy. Well, no, you just, when would you have done it? I guess, I suppose, yeah, it's like yeah, when do if, you you're, do if it? you're in the stadium watching a game. Well, yeah, I hadn't really been to watch many games. I played it, for Australian it? under-21s, so I would have done it there. Uh, we didn't do it at school or anything yeah. like that. So when would you have done it? Yeah, you know? no, that's if true. You, if, you know what, I think about it now, I, probably a handful of times. I've yeah, actually sung the national anthem. Go right? to a game, yeah. and, but when you, when you do it, when there's 80,000 people there waiting for you, you know, counting on your team, kids are waking up the next day going happy or sad on what happened on what you on what you <clears throat> are in charge of what you bring so i i spoke with one of the coaches we had nathan gray who was he's about as dinky die aussie as they come you know what i mean and uh i had a lot of good long talks with him he talked to me about some of the history even the history of the crest mm. where you've got the emu and the kangaroo and advanced australia used to be under it. and that that's conceptually because uh neither animal can take a backward step you know, advance Australia. Even that in itself made me go, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, I mean, already that sort of made me think, forward. let's go then. Yeah. And, you know, that made me think of, you know, as a, as a almost a theme for the team, like we never take a backward step. But yeah. that's something for me personally that I, I really lived during that time in Australia when I was with Australia because I felt that would drive me being an, an outsider mm. from the game and being in the, the position of national coach, I had to – to really take steps forward to first prove myself and then also uh, to help lead the game from not from an administrational point of view, but for everyone that aspired to play in the national colours, mm. which are all my kids would have been doing that and many others, you know. It's so interesting to talk about these things with you because you. my assumption is that from a as an outsider, as in like a fan, not someone who's got no, doesn't touch any of the infrastructure that the national team, I'm, you know, I'm not a coach, I'm not an advisor, I'm definitely not a player. And so my assumption is that the kind of, the conversations that are happening inside that camp are about tactics, about training, about nutrition, that the kind of the symbolism and the, whether it's, you know, does it matter if Tuchel's going to sing the anthem? Does it matter if Checker's going to sing the anthem? Or is he going to sing it with his whole chest? But actually those those symbols, those talismans, if you like, that are associated with the team. The impression I'm getting from talking to you now is that actually they're almost of equal importance to those other sort of more granular training-based well, things that I was mentioning. Let's say uh, with Argentina, some of the boys would say to me, well, I, I built a really good rapport, obviously, with everyone there. I'm very close to them. Um, I still feel very close to them, you know. And 
they would say, oh, you're going to sing the anthem. I said, oh, I'm not. I'm not from your country. I don't have the right to sing your anthem, you know. And we'd, we'd often talk about it and, and, and have a laugh sometimes or yeah, you wouldn't be able to sing it anyway or whatever it might be because especially if they go the long version, you're there for a while, right? <laughs> but it's beautiful, you know. And then maybe we got too emotional in the lead up to the World Cup. Like, so the, the, the before the game, uh, a couple of the lads, before the first game, a couple of lads had a word to me and uh, without giving away too much from the, I mean, I, I asked the players if it would be all right for us who weren't Argentinian to sing the anthem at the World Cup, you know? And it was a pretty, it was one of the most emotional days I've had with a, with a team together. It wasn't, wasn't on the day itself, it was the night before. There was, you know, some tears. There was, you know, I think that you build that connection with players. Well, yeah, with, but it's got to be earned. You yeah. can't fake it. You know, when you go, I've coached in a lot of different countries now. So even uh, not necessarily always an international, like been in Japan, Argentina, Ireland, been, played and coach Ireland, Italy, um, England now, uh, Australia, obviously. So it's very important to understand what you need to know in order to then prepare your players. And I feel like one of the things I, France as well, I've been in. So one of the things that I always try to do, and I've only probably not done it once, would be then to understand before I, it's part of, I suppose, my due diligence is to understand more about how players or people in that nation go to school, how they are educated, because at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're, we're teaching, mm. or, or, you know, it, it's a different type of teaching, but we're teaching. So to understand <clears throat> how players are educated at their, at their junior level, that would then show you, like at school, what their testing system's like. So now my kids, for example, so the one place I didn't prop do it was in France when I coached Stade Francais. It was all very last minute. It happened just off the cuff. I wasn't, I was there. And, and you're there, they, yeah. so, you know, but I should have taken the time. And that experience didn't turn out how I would have liked it to because I don't think I understood enough about how to manoeuvre them mentally. And understanding that is true. And now, so like last few years, I've been living in France and my kids have been going to school there. And now I understand with absolute clarity the difference between what a kid in Australia uh, going to school and, and, a, and a kid in, in France, even the differences in how we would be educated, but the Anglo-Saxons all the same, Australians and English, to understand so it's the small nuances that about what they've, I suppose, been uh, brought up in and almost yeah, institutionalised in, because school is an institution, in how you prepare to understand, learn and take in information and then put that information out in either your job, in a test or in sport. Mm. Just to rewind a little bit to sort of the Argentine national anthem, I always find it very striking as an Englishman watching as the camera goes down the lineup of the Argentina. It's not, I would actually say it's common. It's not uncommon, it's common. Several of the players will be crying whilst they sing the national anthem, right? And actually, as I'm watching England about to play Argentina, it slightly terrifies me <laughs> because you're thinking like, these guys are like ready to die, basically. The, the, the emotional preparation in the weeks building up to the match the hour before kickoff yeah. like without again i don't need to give away too much of name players or anything like that but could you talk us through that process a little bit well it, you've got to think that and if you look at it so the two teams line up and it's it's zero zero it seems like it's an even go but for i suppose for the argentinians in that way it's not even at any stage whatsoever Rugby's that where there's a it's the minor sport over there, much less players to pick from, hugely under resourced. Their game is still based on the foundation of clubs, you know. When players go straight back, they go straight to their club teams, have a barbecue, you know, enjoy that. The spirit inside of the team and the 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 nation is very strong. I feel like they're fighting against the big guys all the time, which they are. They punch so far above their weight. Realistically, uh, it's crazy, and. I think that that passion is shown from how they're brought up in their country with adversity inside their own country and the way they live. Even the economic situation there has created a certain lifestyle that tells them to enjoy each other, enjoy being, you know, the small things, you know, let's have a great barbecue together, let's enjoy it. Let's, it's still very, uh, such a strong community connection, even with lots of other problems that maybe don't exist 
in other parts of the world. And I think it prepares them very well. They've got a great understanding, a difference between nationalism from an emotional point of view and nationalism from a political point of view, mm. right? Because unfortunately in political circles, uh, they've used nationalism to the detriment of you know, whatever subject we talk- could be talking about, international affairs or security or whatever it might be. They've used it as a tool to manipulate and manoeuvre, whereas nationalism in its pure sense is just, I love the country I'm born in and, and or I live in even. Because if you're an immigrant that's gone there, I love the country I'm born in and I love the country I live in and because it, of the people that are there with me and the experiences I have with it and the land itself. You know, for us, it might be the beautiful beaches. It might be the desert. It could be whatever it is. And I think that's a really important experience to understand. For me, I try to understand it because a lot of people say about Argentina uh, in relation to the rugby, oh, no, they're too emotional. You know? And every time you hear commentary, about them and, and and this is the thing that people underrate them because they go oh well they're very emotional and you're always going to get that's every time and they're still people still say it you know that you know you're going to get emotional reaction no these guys can play footy right yeah and the emotion world you don't, cup semi-finalists you don't want to lose it yeah you want to control it that's that's the, one of the big things i try to do with the lads there is about saying no no, no i don't want us to lose our emotions because i played I can play sort of two cards, right? I can play either a Latin card or Mediterranean, yeah, or the Anglo-Saxon more reserved style. And I think <clears throat> down there I needed to play the more Anglo-Saxon card, you know, different to have so I could temper a little bit of the emotion that they have. Right. But help them because I understand it very well because I'm one of those too, uh, help the guys individually, how to control that, how to channel it in the right place. And then also my own emotions in connecting into the to the national psyche, I suppose, and earning my right to to be a part of that. I can, I can never call myself one of them, but to be a part of what they what they have. And I think if you go right back to how this discussion started around Thomas Tuchel, as much as football now, because there's a lot of money involved and huge stakes, etc. we go sometimes too much to the technical to say, how do we get the, how do we make this perfect? You know, nothing's perfect in the game. It's about how you get out of adversity in all games, you know what I mean? Because the players are good enough on their own to, to get to a certain point. Yes, you've got to give them a framework, but there's a balance between the technical and also the emotional that need to go together. I think there's that you hear often they talk about it, the, you know, the blue head and the red head. And, you know, I know All Blacks have been famous for talking about that and it's come from, you know, a certain psychology. I tend to go more for the purple man, yeah, a good balance of both mm. and be able to perform both together, both nervous systems operating at the same time and being able to clearly um, control when one gets out ahead of the other to bring it back, either go up emotionally or or, or come back emotionally or go up technically or logically. Mm. I think how, that's how I've tried to build over the last few years with the different teams I've been involved in. It's so interesting to hear you say this, right? I Last week I had, I had, a, I had a row with someone on the radio, um, like another commentator, where he was basically saying, like, it's absurd that this German guy is managing the English team. And I basically said to him, you cannot make a footballing argument against Tuchel's appointment. I was like, his record in knockout competitions, like winning 65 of 50 games, uh, winning the Champions League with Chelsea. He's won FIFA's best coach of the year. All of his record working with Harry Kane, Rhys James, Jude Bellingham, Jaden Sancho. There isn't a football argument you can make against him. All you have left is this kind of how on earth can a German, you know, stand in a dugout at Wembley? It's, it's basically like sac- sacrilege. And I thought he was stupid for making that argument. Sitting here listening to you now, talking about the importance of kind of emotional calibration of whether that's the team talk before they go out for kickoff the week beforehand and actually can those English players let's say it's a World Cup final against Germany listen to a German man will they will they be able to sort of get that emotional resonance right with him but you've genuinely made me reconsider actually whether I think that's like colossally important well it depends who he puts himself with too like in Argentina if 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 you're coaching club team, okay, the languages, I'm sure uh, Thomas Tuchel can speak English, obviously, he can fluently, right? very yeah. well, you know. 
And the articulation of messages is really important. So for me, and how you do it, now it doesn't always have to be with truth clarity. So for example, I, I was lucky enough that I had a couple of Latin languages before I went to Argentina. But, you know, my preparation to go there was 60 episodes of Narcos and 70 something episodes of Pablo Escobar, Patron de Mal. I right? watch tape. I watch okay. tape. I watch Netflix. And, uh, <laughs> and the subtitles helped me a lot yeah. with the Spanish. So I said to the boys, look, I'm going to speak as much as I can in, um, in Cartagena, in Spanish, right? But when I screw it up, you fix it for me. Mm. You'll know what, because most of them speak English, right? But I, I feel like I'm coaching the national team. I need to speak in their language. And, but use it almost as a tool for, for team building. So when I screw it up, bring me around. If Thomas Tuchel's talking to players about emotional stuff, ask the players. Mm. Harry Kane, what does this mean to you as an Englishman? You know, teach me. Teach me what I need to know about your the emotional side of your culture. Let me learn. Mm. right from you and almost turn it around in that way i think it doesn't matter now because the appointment's made so the the national psyche gets behind that he brings his quality i suppose mm. in his skill of getting the team to play good football and he used maybe he's got assistant coaches who can can bring that conversation but but it was funny i know gareth southgate from met him a couple of times along the way right and i'm a big fan i liked him a lot and i think he did a good job with england if I'm being, you know, totally honest, over a longer period of time. Me too. They, they were quite successful yeah. at many campaigns. There's other things that are going on around how many players, top English players are playing at the top level and competing and all that type of stuff that would be affecting him as well. But I was on a, I was in Paris and I was coming to the UK for some, maybe to come to Leicester one time. And we were on the, the bus going to the, the aeroplane. And I was watching the the qualifier. What well, must have been the European Championships? Was that the most recent one that happened? Uh, yeah. Euros, yeah. yeah. Where they made the final? The yeah, yeah, final. The final. Right. Yeah. They were in one of the games. I can't remember which game it was. And I was watching it on my phone, and it was all English people around me. They were getting beat. I don't know by. They were in one of the games. They were getting beat, and it was quite late. So like Slovenia, is it? Jude Bellingham? Maybe one of them. Okay. Yeah. And I and they, I could hear them. You know, they they're in the win. And I said to them. Oh, do you want to watch a game? I've got it on my phone. So I wouldn't be giving up the ghost. Like the game that was in the late mid nineties, I think, when they got in, then they won in extra time. Yeah. I said I wouldn't be giving up. Like the games go to the. I didn't. They didn't know I was involved in sport or anything. I said games go to the very end. You know, so you guys should get behind the team. Like it's your team. You know. Like, <laughs> and they've got a horse in this race. Yeah. And and uh, you know they can get there. And sure enough, they scored the goal. Oh, and they and they scored the goal. And then all of a sudden they change like, oh, oh okay. So because they were bagging him, yeah. he's got to go, yeah, yeah, got to yeah. go, got to do this, got to do that. And then change and then then they won. But by the time we got onto the plane, <laughs> they'd won the game and they were almost embarrassed, but then still saying, oh, well, still got to go. You know yeah. what I mean? So instead of just with the national team, I think there's, you can have obviously post matches, post games, you can have the, that's the great thing about sport. You can sit in the pub or the cafe have an argument about all the, the good things. And that's what fans are entitled to do, you know what I mean? But I think in the lead, especially the national team, there's there's something different about when they play. And it'll be up to the part of the challenge for the national coach, which I've had to live even in my own country, is also to get your supporters believing in you as well. And I think that's something that, uh, that the English uh, football coach now, will it'll be part of his... If he wants to have the success, it'll be part of his remit. You know, how do I, how do I get everyone on side? Not by placating people, by showing them what I think about doing this job, how I feel about being involved in this, and the, and the, and eventually you can you can you can convince people. And if then the performances follow, because he has got a great um, CV, like I said, especially knockout football, which is what you know the big tournaments are all about, and it's very different to to championship footy. Then the tide turns pretty quickly. And and as long as it's authentic, no 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 trying to fake it, mm. you know. And I think that there's a lot of ways that that can happen. I've I've had to do it myself, and uh, and and once you as the coach really are into that, you you dive into it and you believe it. You're believing it yourself, then yeah, it's more than doable. Can I ask you about that then? With let's take Australia. 
you go into that job and particularly your relationship with with the fans and I guess the country at large and I don't want to put words in your mouth I don't want to put too fine a point on it mm. here but referencing that fact that you are Australian Lebanese was that something that you felt you almost had to surmount or like tell me how taking that job connected to your identity who you were as a person no I think it made me better yeah yeah for sure for sure it made me more Australian without a doubt and and I love that I like that because I wanted to I've always wanted as an ethnic kid growing up you always want to be in another country you well you're born there number one but you're always trying to prove yourself maybe younger you know you for me you know it's a, you take on the surfy kids or yeah you, you know because or whatever and you have the fights then you all become friends in the end once you understand about what you know having more proper multicultural places about and our team in australia was extremely multicultural yep. you know uh, we have so many players of um, polynesian pacific island descent we have you know david pocock you know it was zimbabwe the the there's there's players that come from everywhere because that's the nature of our country mm. so you know we when you come from different lands like that and you're born you, you're brought together under one jersey the identity of the jersey is extremely important and i think that for me it was a great experience i i really that was one of the huge things that changed for me be, becoming australian coach i became a lot more australian and i i really yeah, I thank them for that because it made me feel much better about being in my country it's making me quite emotional hearing you talk about it like that well, it's yeah. true it's yeah. like because I always, in that, and sometimes it's our own perceptions too. I always saw myself as an outsider, yeah, ethnic kid. I don't want to say the the three letter word that they use, you know, yeah. ethnic kid. You know, and even in rugby, there wasn't a lot of, you know, people like you. Rebo kids or yeah, even playing back in the day. Right, we were a bit myself, and my brother. We were a bit out there. There's a few others, you know. So once you get that, it's my own fault, right? Once you get the perception that you're you know, you're outside, then. Right. You almost perpetuate it yourself when you mm. think like that. So, uh, but it definitely the experience of coaching first New South Wales, which, if anything, I was not a fan of. Well, I never got picked. I always had a bit, bit bitter about never getting a run at Rep Footy. You know, they didn't like me. I always had some excuse, you know, <laughs> and uh, which you know, well, it's true. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's it's on me. You know, mm. it's not on anyone else. And so when I went back there, I really had to also understand okay this is how we went to a good process with the players about building a team identity just as much for me as for them so we could all get behind it and push on and then that led into the australia part when you know when i when i got to the with the lads first up on the tour because i got selected and then three days later we were on tour i didn't know half the players and i asked them like what what is it playing for australia like what what's what's our team what i've never played so you need to tell me they they gave me the answers about you know nationalism and all that type of stuff but i said but yeah but you know the english are playing for england and the welsh are playing for wales the kiwis are playing for new zealand so what do we don't have a, a a mortgage on nationalism that makes us that's going to give us more than them what is it about this team and we went through a process then to set our own little in before that 215 world cup to get our identity piece together understand what we stood for as a team and then uh and, and how that linked into representing the country. And it was, yeah, th those few years there were really good buzz around, for me, about learning about the country. What was it you settled on? Was it was it that never take a backwards step? It was in it. It was a bit longer than that. We, we had a way that we could, and we used, but we used our own identity to uh, evaluate our games, mm. to do reviews, match reviews. That's you interesting. Know? Well, as a great Dr. Dre said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? Yeah. And... <laughs> I didn't want to fall, like, especially, I remember on that tour, the 14 tour when we came over, like, I didn't know anything about test footy. So we won the first couple of games and then we came, well, I think we may have lost to, front, I'm not sure, we, then we came to England at the end and they pumped us and they pumped us in the scrum big time. And I said, oh, we have to stand up here and do something different. Or if we don't fix this up before next year, we're no chance. Mm. And, and we did because we got our mindset right and we also got the, the idea of, um, of what we needed to do. We were very clear about what we needed to do in our identity as a team. Because that, we, I don't want to go too far into like actual like technicalities, tactics of the game itself, but like the window between that tour 
And then you go to Twickenham, 2015 World Cup, you score at the time the highest ever total that Australia has scored against England at Twickenham. You knock England out of it's the first time a home host nation has ever been knocked out of the World Cup at the group stage. That is an extraordinary transformation in a very short period of time. How much of that was the identity, the emotion, what it means to pull on the jersey versus, you know, front row technicalities? Yeah, I think it was a good even balance. That emotional connection, the technical points, alignment of the team, bringing back some players who hadn't been in the squad uh, previously. You've got to turn the dial on lots of different things. You can't just count on one. And sometimes when you turn the dial on, say, that emotional side, it can multiply the effect of the other things because some dials you turn are multipliers. Mm. You know, it's like we were talking earlier about you. some players you can bring into a team and they make other players play better. Don't know why, just happens. You know, you feel good about playing with that guy. That's a real thing. And I, I think you've, you've got to, <clears throat> it's not an exact science. You've got to keep turning the dials to see what works, what doesn't. You've got to plant, you've got to maybe drop some anchors along the way, see what takes and what doesn't and what does, and you've got to run with it. So if you felt more Australian than ever taking on that gig, what was it like going to Lebanon? And, and doing that role with the rugby yeah, league team. That was that was one of the, like I suppose the World Cup in itself is one of the best things I've been able to do in, in, in for sport, you know, in my time. Because what we did was we had a whole group of fellas like me, second generation, who were able to to teach a lot about their, their homeland, feel the passion to represent their homeland. We had four or five players from Lebanon in the squad, which was amazing. They they were such a good part of the squad, you know, uh, and it was just a buzz. You know, we had high, good quality coaches, some couple with a Lebanese background, couple without, and they, you know, they became honorary lebs, you know, it was, it was awesome. And, and it, we were able to play well above our weight. And I think that's what, when you can get control and use emotion correctly, what it can do is it can make you play above your potential. Oh, no, not your potential. It makes you actualize your potential. Mm. So you've got a limit that you think you've got. That emotion might take you up there and you realize, okay, well, now I can get to there. Maybe I can actualize that all the time and then push on again. There's a quote from the captain, Mitchell Moses, talking about you. He's talking about you as a motivator. And the thing he said was the way he can get you up for a game, I've never seen it before, to be honest. What, yeah. what, does, he, what does he mean by that? Oh, mate, I don't know. You'd have to ask him, I suppose. But like... <laughs> Come on. That, no, I, I feel like I played the game always with a lot of emotion and maybe too much sometimes. And I feel like the, uh, that getting guys to understand how they can put the emotion, what they can use emotion for in the games and make you feel good about playing, like really good about playing for a cause, for a reason, and that you're representing others, not just you, you're representing others. I think that's a really powerful, powerful tool. And we used all different techniques. There's lots of different techniques you can use. Um, Could you give some examples? Well, everything from, you know, videos to messaging that you use, identity piece, um, other people coming in to talk to the team, uh, some language that you can use throughout uh, different symbols. Symbols are a huge cultural art um, uh, tool that have been used. Yeah, look at religion. There's, there's symbols everywhere. There's in history. So, using different symbols, there's lots of ways that you can make the connections. You know, you can use pictures. You can use anything. You know, or interactivity of players in certain in different projects. So you can really get them. You can really get people thinking about it in another way and visualizing. Uh, what the theme of where we want to go in this season or in this this uh, this event all the way to the end. Mm. That was a quote from Moses. This is a quote from you talking about the Lebanon job. It's not even about that first and foremost. It's about the fact Lebanon is there on the world stage, giving the people of Lebanon the chance to have an hour or two free of the worries that they face on a daily basis. I mean, I don't know how political you want to get in this conversation. You don't have to if you don't want to, but could you expand on that and Maybe actually, uh, is your messaging to the team kind of like, Razzie does it a lot with South Africa, I've seen on like Chasing the Sun and things like that. Mm -hmm. He talks about what it actually means for their fans back home to see the team playing in the way it is, doing what it's doing on the world stage. Yeah, well, uh, the thing is, mate, that in Lebanon, not a lot of people are going to know what rugby league is, right? But I don't think it matters. They see their team on TV and their flag. Right? They had the basketball that played not long before us in the World Cup. 
they had the flag up there. And, you know, I've been there in, in a time that's like happening right now. I've been there in 06 when, you know, had to escape that way through Syria at the time. You see how hard it is for people and for them to get, and even the economic situation, yeah. everything that's happened there, just to get an hour or a couple of hours to get away from all those problems and then uh, just enjoy a game of football or a game of rugby or a game of basketball or whatever and cheer for their country because the country's being being bashed up by people that aren't even from the country mm -hmm. and the people inside of country are just like a punching bag and they got no way they can get out of it. So just to have that free time in their mind, you know, I know my own relatives who know nothing about rugby league, they were all talking about it on WhatsApp group and that they were there and, you know, they were able to watch some on, online, on YouTube, they were so proud, you know, it was, it was really good. Mm. Something to be proud of, I guess, as well. You mentioned there uh, about fleeing Lebanon in 06 via Syria. I hadn't heard, I wasn't aware about that. I mean, would you mind talking about that a little well, bit? Well, yeah, um, uh, the, uh, I was actually with my, my, the business I've got, we were in the States, <clears throat> I was there with my sister actually doing some some work over there. I was coaching Leinster at the time. So it was the off season and pre-season was about to start. I had one year at Leinster at the time. So I went over to the States, met her and uh, and we had some some bad news while we were there about my cousin who I did speak about yeah, earlier yeah, who yeah. passed away in Lebanon on a trip there. And so it was pretty hectic. We, we were brought up like all brothers and sisters pretty much. So... He was from Australia. He was there on a visit, and uh, so I, I wanted to go for the for the funeral. I sent my sister back to Oz, and and I came. I went back through Ireland. Actually, I was able to get back to go to get to Lebanon, and I stayed there a few days. My cousins were there from Australia, and and the day I was due to leave, uh, Israel invaded. They bombed the airport. Um, I actually didn't even, we're up in the north, I didn't even know someone from Australia rang us up and said, are you okay, what's going on? So uh, the, it was quite a big um, invasion. A lot of infrastructure was blown up. Um, there was a full-scale evacuation, you know, of many people. Uh, I'd say it was slightly different to what's happening now. It was much more targeted, so they took the airport out. They took out a lot of infrastructure. Um, and... Uh, we were sort of stuck up in the north. The, there was no fighting where we were exactly or bombing. Tripoli, maybe 20 minutes away. Uh, but we waited a few days to see what was going on. And it didn't look like that was going to stop. So I, I, I had to get back. Pre-season training was starting. I <laughs> Training's thought, on Monday, mate. Yeah, well, pretty much. That was the discussion, <laughs> right? And... Uh, and it was, it was pretty weird. Like my cousins took me down to the local prefecture, right, and they got me some documents. I don't know what they said, right. I had my, my photo on it. So they said, we're going to try and go through Syria. We just got a water cache of US to bribe your way through. There was a few other guys in the car with me that came to – I had to drive to Tripoli where there was a bit of action, get in the car and then go out to Syria, through Syria. Syria hadn't had – problems at that stage so if you got to syria it was plain sailing to the airport now i didn't have a ticket or anything but anyway we'll, we'll cross that bridge when yeah. we come to it yeah so we tried the driver tried several border crossings because you'd want to go back through um the west no the yeah the western side or well, no the eastern side excuse me the eastern side across the mountains and and at many crossings it was impossible to get over the amount of people that were trying to get out on foot. Um, and it's it's pretty hairy because you can hear the planes. Yeah, it's a small country. Uh, there's obviously military already there. The Syria had, had an occupation going on at the time, so there's a lot of weaponry around. There's shooting going on that you can hear in the distance. I, we would have tried, I think, three different um, exits, like border crossings. And couldn't get across any of them. And then uh, the guy was getting quite frustrated, the driver. And I remember he took us down a road that had like, I would, I think it was sugar cane maybe, high, really high. So it was one road and either side of you, there was 
sugar cane that was quite high, like a size of a double decker bus maybe. And we drove there for maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Through, if a car was coming another way, you you were shot. I don't know. You, I don't know what would have happened. Mm. And he popped out right on the coast, and I looked to the left. So if you go right, there's the frontier to go to Syria. There's border gates. It'd be like you know you see sometimes on the cinema or uh, movies the Mexican crossing and uh, with the US. It, it was like that. Mm. But you look to the left, and there was a highway of cars as far as you could see, like. I don't know. It was like to the horizon of five across cars trying to get out. And so he somehow pushed his way in there. And in between Syria and Lebanon, there's a no man's land like where you have to. So I was hoping that with those documents, I wouldn't need a visa because mm. I had Australian passport, which, yeah, okay, you're still a bit of a Westerner going into Syria. It wasn't, you know, you need a visa. So I got in there and that's when the, we started using the cash, obviously, get it. There was a visa office that maybe was, um, what could I say? It wasn't huge. It was maybe 80 square metres, 100 square metres max. There was, I don't know how many hundred people in there trying to get visas, people outside try, trying to come climb in through the windows, shol- soldiers shooting in the air. To make, and now I think I can handle myself in most situations, but I was like, I'm just hiding in the corner here and letting this guy do what he does. There would have probably been couple of hundred thousand people in the no man's land. So many foreigners I saw that were lost, crying, had kids trying to get out. I could have just disappeared off the face of the earth then and I would have known. Mobile phones were in. I had one, but and there's no reception. And you could hear the, the jets obviously need the length of the country to turn around almost after they bomb Beirut. So I was trying to help other people, trying to get myself through. The driver was going to leave. It was so hectic. So I probably had 10 hours there trying to get myself through probably spent about i don't know seven eight hundred us in paying people because he he did it all for me i just sat back and yeah. hoped for the best the other guys who i was with they had access already so they had the they weren't happy because they wanted just to get going and it was just I, I suppose the biggest thing for me were the thoughts i had when i was in there for those hours going like you could genuinely just disappear here and no one would know what happened to you ever. Mm. It was, it really brought so many things home and I felt like I was leaving my relatives behind. Both my Aussie relatives were there. They eventually got out a month later on ships the British sent in to take them out to Cyprus and then flew home from there. And my, my Lebanese cousins who were there in that, you know, I've been there many times in Civil War time as well where, you know, you're driving at one side of the road and it's cars, the other side of the road, there's militia aircraft, you know, mm. taken off using it as a runway. So... It's always had that, but this was a little different. It was heavy, you know, it was heavy bombardment. So luckily I got through eventually. And I remember uh, when I got into Syria, I got a reception back and I got some, there was a whole heap of messages started coming from Shane Horgan and Dennis Hickey. They say, we've already had four coaches in four years. We can't lose another one to a war. That would be ridiculous, you know? And I had a laugh about it. And then I got to Damascus maybe at... uh, I don't know, two in the morning. I just went to the uh, to a local cafe. Well, like I said, I didn't have a ticket. I went to a cafe in town, got on the, the Argile. I don't even smoke. I was on the thing, <laughs> coffees, just going, what am I doing here? Like I was literally on my own in yeah. Damascus. Guess I'm no, Syrian now. <laughs> what, I, I genuinely didn't even know, like, well, I didn't even know if I'd get a ticket out of the airport because yeah. I had a ticket from Beirut. Mm. Um, back to uh, Ireland, where there, France, I think it was, uh, through Paris. And I went to, <clears throat> I just went at four, four, five o'clock in the morning. I got a taxi to the airport and uh, just turned up at a, at Air France desk and they, they, they took me. Yeah. And I remember going in like, it was just, it was surreal because I was in all of that for the last 24 hours. And then I was sitting in the, uh, in the lounge waiting to take off, bought a backgammon set and everything. Well, it was just like normal travel. And then watching the TV and BBC was on and one of the border crossings where I was and couldn't get through there, they, they were reporting. I remember seeing the reporters there, you know, as they were doing it and thinking, this is extremely weird. Yeah, and surreal. you feel guilt because you're leaving people behind. You feel happy because you're, you're, you're out. Yeah, And that's a, a huge problem. Just now I've had my... 
relatives from Australia who were able to get out, who were there, they were able to get out on a flight to Cyprus that was organised by one of the governments. I'm not sure if it was British or Australian. But the guilt that they had leaving their relatives behind, that they got nowhere else to go, it's not their fault at all. And, why, well, you know, it's, it's absolutely painful. Yeah. It's painful to watch. I've got no doubt about that. Gives you, I'm sure it gives you a, a very strong sense of perspective. And it almost, you know, when I'm, over the course of this interview, when I've been asking you about like emotional depth and motivation, when you've witnessed, when you've experienced, survived things like that, it maybe almost sort of pales, the, the sort of the rugby side of things pales in comparison, right? When you're talking about life and death, the destruction of a country. You've, well, you've seen those emotional depths, right? Yeah, and mate, I think with all of these things, football, rugby, I know they're important and they're, they're extremely important in the lives of people, that, but context is extremely important because everyone always asks, oh, the pressure, the pressure of the games. There's no pressure in these. Like genuinely, they're games. They're games. Yes, there's money at stake and there's all those types of things. There's people out there doing real jobs, you know. There's people in the hospital saving lives. There's like soldiers out there having to fight wars. There's, you know, people building houses so that people can afford to live. There's people out there doing real, real things. We're in a in, in a in a place that's superb, you know. You've got the opportunity. So anyone who who thinks pressure, it's not none at all. It's excitement. It's um, sadness. It's anger. It's all the things that we live for, you know, all those emotions that you should have, you know, and, and, and enjoy with the sport. And yes, of course, you've got a job to do. You want, you want to win more than anything and you want to win your way wherever possible. Yeah. Do you, I, I feel like sport is simultaneously, it's like nothing and everything, right? Because for all the reasons you've just outlined, it pales in significance to the everyday side of things. And yet it means so much and it's like a paradox that's tied up in it that i just i can't ever unravel people support teams this is what i believe at least you know people support teams passionately because they identify with what that team gives them it me it, it ident they identify personally with that team the passion that they have or something about that team identifies with the person and say, yes, I want to be a part of it. You're a Liverpool supporter. There's a clear identity you want to be a part of. I see it. I've got a lot of friends who are who are real Liverpool supporters and you see it in them. And we as people, a uh, majority of us, we want to be part of community. But that's how we, we, we live. It's how we are. So when we see something that we can identify with, whether it's our national team or whether it's our club team or whatever it might be in, in sport or the arts maybe is another thing that it can happen, we identify with it and that's why it's so important to us because we can feel connected to that. It makes us proud to be part of that and they go on and win, how good, you know? Mm. And I think that's extremely important and I think maybe that could come back to the very first question a little bit about identification of the, of, of the national people with their national team. Identify with the team, right? The coaches are part of the team but identify with the team and, and when the team comes up against the rival, then... You can be part of that. And, I, and of course, yeah, winning is one part of it, but it's generally a consequence of how people feel about either playing in that shirt or supporting in that shirt. Michael Checker, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you about all of this stuff. So insightful, so intelligent. I'm, I've been moved by this conversation, <laughs> genuinely. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I really appreciate it. No, thank you.